Hey, good morning, everyone. It's Wednesday, January the 26th. I'm Dr. Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System, broadcasting live with you from the Dahl Simons Family Studio. Welcome to another statewide news and community conference with Chief Medical Officers and Infectious Disease Specialists from both sides of the state line here in the Kansas City metro area and across greater Kansas. Since this last gathering three weeks ago, COVID cases have doubled, hospitalizations and deaths are setting records, and hundreds of healthcare workers with COVID have caused major surgical delays. This is hands down, hands down the toughest surge the medical community has had to face since the pandemic began two years ago. We will share some quick graphics depicting where we are in the surge, then hear very briefly from 18 physicians, including myself, you know, I'm always kind of mouthy, mouthy and wordy. After that, we will open this up to reporters in the community for questions. The Zoom link is exclusively for reporters today. Please see your name and news organization when asking questions. Members of the community should put their questions into the chat feeds where you are watching. Jessica Lavelle will monitor those feeds for questions, and we've asked stations who are restreaming this to monitor their chats to share their viewers' questions as well. Let's begin. Last time, there was a glimmer of hope on the horizon as Omicron was starting to drop in South Africa, and it still is. But while the rest of the world may be seeing a steep decline, and various parts of the United States are as well, the Northeast is really seeing a steep decline, but that's not the case here in our region, and it's not the case in the state of Kansas. In fact, the state of Kansas is seeing the largest per capita increase in cases of any states in the United States. Not exactly the place you want to be. So that's where we are this morning. You know what? There are places where it's great to be first and places, what was that line from Ricky Bobby? If you're not first, you're last. I'd like to be last on that last statistic. Right now, I'd like to bring in Dr. Richard Watson, co-founder of Motion, the company which created Mission Control and is the app the Kansas Department of Health and Environment uses to connect rural hospitals and trying to transfer patients. Dr. Watson, show us the latest graph you have depicting the pressure on rural hospitals to make transfers. We know that COVID-19 is most rapidly rising in rural areas right now. Are things any better or are they, are, are they harder right now? Well, good morning and thanks. Uh, if you put the graphic up, we'll walk through a couple uh, pictures that uh, might help convey it. The graph on the left is gonna be the standard uh, transfer graph I showed the last time. And it shows how much higher we are on the number of transfers and transfer requests. It does show a downtrend. And I think that's important to note that uh, we are on somewhat of a downtrend on transfers in the system. And that means instead of 40 to 60 patients waiting hours, days for transfers, we're now to 25, 35, 45, uh, waiting at any one time. I think the, the significant graph is the one on the right, and that's a graph we use to track where the capacity in the system is and what that does to the wait times for people waiting to be transferred. The y-axis is capacity. We track a scale of one to three, three meaning every hospital is full. Just for relevance, we've seen three for the last two months. There have been no breaks. This morning when I checked, there was uh, completely no capacity in the system. And so the x-axis on this are hours of waiting time. And as we see that the rates of uh, capacity reach the 2.5, 2.6 level, we see the waiting times get very protracted four, five, six times the normal waiting time. The relevance of this is that as we go backwards in the scale, we have to go back down that curve. And really the steepest part of the curve is a capacity 2.5, 2.6. And that is where we need to be to really start to see the transfer times are affected. What does that mean? That means realistically, no matter how you measure disease rates in the state right now, we have to be at least 50% less on case rates than we are right now. Whether you measure it by positive tests, test positivity rates, or hospitalizations, it doesn't really matter. We've got to be 50% from where we are. We're at least two to three weeks out from that, which means another two to three weeks out from the, the time when we see any change in the capacity. Uh, the state opening up the VA sources really helped a lot. We think that affected what we're doing. We appreciate the fact it turned around so quickly and we were able to mobilize that but still at a level now where nobody's feeling any break right now. And that I think that's important. 
When you last were with us, you mentioned that about five times the normal number of patients died in emergency rooms waiting in December. Any sense of where that will go currently? You know, we had a January that was every bit of that, and uh, the December and January rates were very similar. Um, we'll see what uh, February brings. Right now, there's no relief on the horizon in that regard. We're still working with facilities to make sure that people get cared for in the way they need to be cared for, and we're doing everything, and I know everyone on this call is the same, doing everything we can to take care of the people of Kansas. You bet. And I know we continue to struggle with our transfer center. We normally accept 70% of patients. I think we're still in the 17 to 22% range, nowhere near where we need to be, especially when we're getting twice or three times the normal number of requests for transfers, mostly from rural hospitals. Well, it's time to hear the current inpatient numbers across the metro. Dr. Hawk isn't quite here yet, so we're going to grab him as soon as he comes in. So let me turn first to the Chief Medical Officer at Advent Health, Shawnee Mission, Dr. Lisa Hayes. Lisa, how are things at Shawnee Mission? Good morning. Well, I have to say that they're slightly better than they were two weeks ago, but they're still much worse than they were um, at our peak with Delta back in August. Yesterday, we had 63 active inpatients and 20 that had recovered from their infection for a total of 83. Our peak was on January 11th, where we had 82 active infections and 13 that had recovered. So we're down about 13% from uh, two weeks ago, but still much higher than our peak ever was in August. Uh, we currently have six in the ICU that with active infections and six that have recovered. The majority of those are on a ventilator. Uh, we have nine holding in our ERs awaiting in our ER awaiting uh, admission. Um, our longest wait is 32 hours. <clears throat> it's a long time to spend on a cot in an it's ER. a long time. Uh, we currently have uh, 95 employees out with COVID and 65 of those are clinical. And that's 2.7% of our employees out with COVID. And what we're seeing is that um, we are having to cut down on some of our elective procedures that require a bed last week. And this week we have cut uh, our uh, procedures by 50%, but a lot of times um, not only um, are our staff out sick, but our patients are also sick and having to delay procedures because they have COVID as well. So that's the status at Advent Health Shawnee Mission. Still busy. Whoever thought you'd have 63 patients with one disease that we never had before. Dr. Kim McGow, Chief Medical mm -hmm. Officer at HCA Midwest. How are things for y'all? Morning. Um, I would say that we are um, seeing a little bit of improvement in the total number of COVID patients in the market. This morning, we're at uh, 286. We peaked on January 18th at 354. So we have seen an improvement. However, that still represents 25% of our inpatient volume. So we're still really um, stressed. It is still much higher than the previous peak from a previous surge in August, which um, <clears throat> the peak at that time was 212. We have seen a, a very slight improvement in our ability to take transfers in, but that um, waxes and wanes pretty quickly, depending on what's going on in the local emergency rooms. Um, we continue to see patients die. We continue to see patients in the ICU and on ventilators. Right now, out of that 286, we have 38 in the ICU and 17 of those are on the ventilator. That number has not much changed from previous reports that I've given to this group. So it's still a significant number. And as of this morning, about half an hour ago, we were holding 62 patients in our emergency rooms. So still uh, quite um, congested. Um, our mortality rate is about 11.2%. So um, really not improved from previous peaks. So it's still you know, a significant illness. I think there's um, a perception in the community and some of that's accurate that um, it's not as, um, the Omicron variant is not as severe overall. And there's some truth to that, but for the patients who are hospitalized, it is you know, continuing to be a severe illness and requiring lots of resources to care for them. I did read something yesterday uh, saying that the majority of the staffing problems in hospitals in our country is related to asymptomatic employees who have tested positive and had to be sent home. I would disagree with that, at least for our hospital system. The employees who've had to go home are sick. They're testing positive yeah. and they're sick. They're not going home just because of a positive test. In fact, we're not testing asymptomatic people. So uh, I would say that that was an inaccurate report that I read. 
So I would say overall, the outlook seems to be a little bit more positive. It seems to have reached a peak, but we're still far higher in the volume of patients we're caring for than we were at the last peak in the late summer. Yeah, it is. It's been tough. And I hate it when people make up information to fit their narrative. You know, that just doesn't drive you a little crazy because we're just going to tell you the truth. These are just true numbers, folks. And uh, if we're trying to make up some narrative about gloom and doom, we wouldn't even tell you when things are a little better. So uh, clearly we're telling you the truth. Dr. Aguadega, Chief Medical Officer, Liberty Hospital. How are things there? Hi, thank you for having me. Um, it's uh, almost a similar story here. Um, our numbers have come down from the peak that we saw last week. Uh, we are currently at uh, 44, 10 in ICU, nine on the ventilators. And uh, I truly hope that uh, this is actually a downward trend and not just a blip. I'm uh, cautiously optimistic. But having said that, uh, some of these have resulted from uh, unfortunate deaths. We've had 30 deaths, uh, many unnecessary. Uh, the, this is uh, you know, 30 deaths by the first 25 days of this month. And uh, in my experience, years uh, being here, I had not seen these kind of numbers uh, ever, uh, pandemic or otherwise. And uh, uh, you know, shortages uh, continue to uh, cause problems for us, just like everyone else. Um, staffing is one of them. And of course, uh, testing, the PCR testing, uh, we've been helped out by uh, MOD. Uh, outside laboratory um, drugs, we have zero monoclonals currently, and we have zero Paxlovid, and uh, those are the things that uh, help prevent hospitalizations. And we have uh, absolutely uh, zero availability. But on the other hand, you know, being flexible and uh, finding uh, you know all sorts of uh, innovative solutions on day-to-day -day basis at the incident command, that's been the name of the game um, during this pandemic. And uh, we find solutions, and uh, physicians and staff have been the shining stars so far. So, um, uh, really, uh, it's the same story everywhere. Yeah, it is. Jack, be nimble. Jack, be quick. Trying to get over that candlestick all the time. Maybe it's over the COVID stick. Dr. Elizabeth yeah. Long, Chief Medical Officer of Olathe Health. Good morning. Um, we also are seeing a decrease in our COVID patients. Um, but we did have a high, just like everybody else, of 57 just uh, about 10 days ago. And we did have to implement our capacity management plan where we did have to throttle back on our surgeries, especially ones that were going to result in a patient that needed a bed because we were having to go on diversion for other issues like STEMIs and strokes, which are very time sensitive issues. And our goal obviously is to take care of the entire community. Um, in addition, significant uh, staff shortages also contribute to our um, implementing that uh, capacity management plan. Uh, we are getting a little bit of breathing room. We are down from our high of 57 to 27 COVID patients um, with one on the vent. However, I don't know if that number actually reflects um, all of the acuity because there's a lot of patients a lot of these COVID patients that are just on the cusp of needing a ventilator that are on high flow oxygen and so i'm not sure just the ventilator number reflects that but yeah. we do have 34 employees out and it is running rampant with the absences that we're having from our employees entire units are basically kind of going down. And the neat thing is, is um, most of the employees, the vast majority, you know, are vaccinated. And so they're just at home. And so it's more of an inconvenience, but um, certainly we are missing them here in the workplace. Yes. All right, Dr. Mark Steele, Executive Chief Clinical Officer at University Health. How are your numbers looking today? Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, so uh, we also are seeing some improvement here at University Health compared to last week when we saw had our all-time highs. And at one point last week, all of our ICU beds were full and we had two ICU level patients holding in our ED awaiting beds. Today, uh, we have a total of 126 COVID positive patients in our hospitals. Uh, this represents about 35% of our total licensed bed capacity. 78 of the 126 have active infections and 48 are recovering, 13 are in the ICU and we have nine on ventilators. Uh, we also have had a very high uh, number of deaths. We have 39 uh, so far in January, including one overnight. That's nearly double our previous high of 22 deaths in August. 
We continue to run full at both our hospitals. Uh, we currently are holding five admitted patients on our in our emergency department. Our staffing remains uh, pretty tenuous day to day and shift to shift with uh, over 100 of our employees currently out related to COVID, but this number is trending uh, in improvement or as we're seeing improvement in that number. Our demand for COVID testing remains quite high. Our call volume has dropped off from a couple of weeks ago and we continue to perform about 500 tests per day between our two drive through testing sites. And our test positivity rate was nearly 40%, but it's begun to drop off some over the past few days uh, down into the mid 30s. And we also last week had to uh, postpone some of our surgeries requiring inpatient beds because of how busy we were. So that's how things are here at University Health. Thanks, Mark, and, and glad those numbers are a little better for you. But Dr. Patricia A. Martin, St. Luke's Health System VP of Medical Affairs for the South and East Regions. Dr. Martin, how are things for St. Luke's? Good morning, and thank you for having me. Uh, similar to the other physicians speaking on this call, uh, St. Luke's currently, the health system has 268 COVID positive patients. Unfortunately, we have not seen the improvement and are hopeful with um, that, that coming our way as well. Our ICUs are at capacity. Our staff is working very, very hard, um, but we too have staff out due to illness and um, it makes it challenging uh, for the whole team. We're flexing uh, some of our outpatient visits to video visits to free up staff. Uh, we have also had to postpone some of our elective uh, surgeries that are requiring a bed in order to free up that staff to care for our patients on the floor. And um, it's just very, very challenging. As, as we mentioned earlier, the community, it's not just COVID patients that we're here to care for. It's uh, these time sensitive critical diagnoses of stroke and heart attacks and trying to get those patients taken care of as well when our ERs are swamped and we're at capacity. Indeed, it is a problem for all of our patients. Dr. Ma Batras, Chief of Staff at the Kansas City VA Hospital. What's your COVID count with our veterans today, Ahmad? Well, unfortunately, I wish I would say uh, we are on a trend down. Uh, we are at an all-time high for us uh, for the last now 10 days or a couple of weeks. Um, we're at 37 today, um, and that's uh, we peaked yesterday at 38. That's over 35% of our bed capacity here. Uh, five of them are in the ICU and one on the vent, um, and, and like the others, the others in the ICU are really close to be on the vent also because they're on high flow oxygen or BiPAP. Um, the um, um, bed capacity for us is struggling quite a bit. No ICU bed is available at all. Um, and uh, in fact, over the weekend, we did accept um, uh, three transfers from like 300 plus miles away in rural Kansas uh, for non-veterans. So we, uh, we did open up, uh, uh, we had some beds back then and uh, we opened up some capacity for non-veterans using our fourth mission. Uh, to to help uh, the community and uh, and these veterans these these patients were really sick um, and they went to the ICU. Um, currently, we have uh, 542 active outpatient. Uh, the outpatient peak was about was in the week of January 10 through 14. So that's uh, that's uh, seems like there's a trend down. We peaked at 650 or so on the active outpatient. Uh, so we're hopeful that the uh, hospitalization will follow uh, in uh, next week. We'll see maybe a trend down as well. Um, we do have a lot of employees out for due to COVID, 83 of them uh, currently active with COVID, which is trending down similar to the outpatient and most of our employees are vaccinated as well. Um, um, as far as the, uh, what we did also, we limited the visitation. Uh, we, um, so we were really not allowing visitors except for compassionate cases at this time to, pro to kind of reduce the risk of in-hospital transmission. We, we have also um, activated additional 12 beds and that allowed us to, to help the community with the taking transfers uh, from the ICU, but that is uh, through implementing contingency staffing. So our current staff would not allow us to, to open additional beds, but we were able, able to do that by basically increasing the patient to nurse ratio. Uh, so not a not a good thing to, to continue and not sustainable for sure, but it's something that we felt we needed to do for the pandemic, for the crisis at this time. Um, 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 
we we had uh, uh, 10 deaths in January uh, due to COVID um, for our veterans, unfortunately, and uh, uh, kind of similar story to everyone else. Yeah, tough. It's a bad, tough, still a difficult story. Dr. Jennifer Scrimshaw is an infectious disease physician at LMH Health and Deputy Public Health Officer of Douglas County. Jen, how are things looking? Um, as usual, Dr. Stites, we are trailing Kansas City. Um, we had an increase in patients over the over the weekend. Um, we were in the low 20s and we hit, um, I think, 26 or 27 over the weekend. We're back down to 22 active, fiber in the ICU, no vents today. Unfortunately, we've had two deaths already this week, um, and our heart goes out to those families, as always. Um, we also continue to have a, a, around 80 staff out, um, which has been what we've, we've been out for, I don't know, a couple of weeks. I expected it to drop off, but I think as it moves through the community and into the schools and we have parents, it's just continuing to uh, keep our staff out. We've been fortunate to be able to mobilize staff. We're working hard to maintain um, our uh, very high expectations for patient care. We've had to cap surgeries. We um, look at this daily, but right now we're keeping um, surgeries capped for those requiring an inpatient stay. We're working very hard with our community partners to um, maintain availability of testing. That's been one of the biggest um, struggles for us. We continue to, to keep PCR and our drive-through available. We, um, like I said, working very hard with um, community partners throughout the county to, to, to be able to offer testing, unfortunately, uh, I also know that a lot of people are just not testing and um, uh, we need people to test so that we know that they need to stay home and not infect their coworkers and family members and um, classmates. We're working hard to maintain treatment, you know, decrease levels of monoclonals. I mean, it's just not available. So we've set up a, a, a way to get remdesivir to outpatients um, and we are, you know, in Douglas County, we rely a ton on public support. So we were also lucky to um, be able to to get a, a public health order for a mask, uh, to, for masks in Douglas County and public spaces. Um, so, you know, my thanks goes out to the community, our community partners, our staff to try to continue <laughs> this uh, as we're all just exhausted, continue to take care of our patients. Yeah, COVID weariness is real. Well, let's go further west to Topeka, where Dr. Jackie Hyen is the Chief Medical Officer at the University of Kansas Health System in St. Francis. How are things? Hi, uh, good morning. Um, so about the same, uh, but shout out to Douglas County um, and the mask man mandate. Um, Dr. Dishman and I have reached out and worked very closely with the Shawnee County Medical Officer here. I did request, um, you know, for them to put a mask mandate in Shawnee County to support um, the, you know, the increasing numbers unfortunately, um, but they, they did not hear us. So um, we are, I believe, um, in a plateau. Currently, our numbers today are 40. We do have seven who um, are in that recovered um, category. We have seven in the ICU um, and uh, 28 um, medical status. So seeing the increase in medical status um, is due to uh, our inability to discharge to nursing homes due to the staffing issues there as well. Um, and we've seen a decrease in our ICU um, admissions, um, but unfortunately, um, we've seen a significant amount of deaths over the last um, last four weeks, with um, uh, about 35 deaths um, due to COVID or COVID-related um, issues. Um, so, really, that's been our our story over the last um, several weeks is um, just the increasing amount of individuals who are passing. Um, uh, and those individuals who are in the ICU, 80% um, uh, um, or greater are, are unvaccinated um, or who have not received their boosters or do have um, the in inability to mount that immune response. So that's, yeah. uh, you know, our yeah. start from right here in, at St. Francis. Thank you. And we're going to stay in Topeka with Dr. Kevin Dishman, the Chief Medical Officer at Stormont Vale Health. How are things there? Thanks, Dr. Stites. Um, we have... We thought we were in a plateau. We saw an increase overnight to, to uh, 74, 75 patients. Uh, one of the reasons is uh, we have had staff that have been shifting to alternate roles as everyone else has as well. Our, our advanced practice registered nurses and our physician's assistants have uh, gone to bedside. One of the reasons we did that uh, was to try to accommodate more transfers from the rural area 
uh, as we were speaking about earlier. We were able to get our uh, accepted transfers up to about 60% yesterday um, and have been working closely with Dr. Watson and his team and developed a command center concept in an effort to uh, work with his team and, and try to provide additional beds to, uh, to our to our rural colleagues. Uh, and we're seeing that uh, across the state. Uh, I think that um, we're, uh, we're going to make it through this. I have no doubt about that. Uh, but uh, we have a lot of people that are, that are working in roles in the ED and in the express care in the respiratory clinic uh, physicians as well as uh, as as um, as our uh, APP colleagues, and um, there's a monumental effort going on, and we will continue that effort. Um, but we are seeing an increase, as uh, Dr. Highland said. Uh, we're not through this yet, and as Dr. Scrimshaw said, we're lagging behind uh, in terms of uh, where our plateau is, and we're not there yet. So we're still seeing an increase uh, in patients here. Continue to have a 45% test positivity rate, so Ouch. it remains Ouch. widespread in our community. Yeah, that's a high rate. Well, we're going to turn to the south center part of Kansas and to our other major uh, metropolitan area and hear from Dr. Semir. Sam Antonio is the Chief Clinical Officer at Ascension Via Christi in Wichita. Sam, how are things? Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Dr. Stice. So um, in our system in the Kansas, uh, the system level, in our, all our hospitals in Kansas, we currently have 210 patients, um, which is still at a very high mark. It's, only about six to seven percent less than it was last week. Um, so maybe we're at a plateau. It's a little bit risky to predict the future, but um, we we may have reached the top. But I, we've been proven wrong in the past as well. Um, in just the Wichita area, we have 180 patients in the hospital. Uh, we have 50 patients in the ICU, and we've got about the, the system level of 15 or 16 patients who are on a ventilator. So still a high mark for us, a lot of patients hospitalized. Um, the rate of the growth might have started to slow down, but um, that is still a lot of patients in the hospital. And it's gonna take a while before those numbers go down um, to a level that would make the operations um, less challenging. Yeah, that is, that's a tough number. Well, let's get into rural Kansas and visit with Dr. Robert Freelove, who's the Chief Medical Officer at Salina Regional Health Center. I'm sure I'm a little, a little hesitant to talk about it. Just we have seen a, a little bit of an improvement here over the last six days or so. We've been averaging between 25 and 30 inpatients the last six days. We're kind of in that 20 to 22 range. Um, we're 20 now with four in the ICU, three on ventilators. Um, unfortunately, uh, if you go back through December, <clears throat> uh, we've had um, we're up to uh, 27 deaths now. So. We're averaging just just under a death every other day. Um, so um, while our case rates are still quite high in the, in the community, we've seen a little bit lower uh, hospitalization. Um, uh, I think it was said the last time we, we talked was uh, a smaller percentage of a large number is still a pretty large number. So um, that, uh, um, that belief that it's just a cold, I think uh, um, is, is clearly not, not the case. So. Um, probably our biggest challenge right now is uh, staff shortages and illness. We had 120 out, um, 85 of those who were positive. Um, to put that into perspective, if, if it's a 10 day out, um, which it currently is for healthcare workers, that's 850 days, which is just a little over two years of lost um, uh, work, workforce. Um, uh, if you look at that, it's just one person. So um, facing significant challenges there, we've had to limit um, Surgeries, uh, elective surgeries that require a bed overnight. We've we've had to limit that for quite some time now. We've been on that for several weeks, and then uh, just this week, um, because the especially our OR has really been hit hard with staffing shortages. We've had to actually postpone some just outpatient elective surgeries as well. So um, we've we've uh, we're struggling to try and meet our community and region's needs, but uh, staff shows up every day that can and that we're allowing to let work and. Uh, proud of what our nurses and physicians and APPs, are, what everybody who's stepping up and trying to fill in the gaps and, and care for as many people as possible. It's a big number, isn't it? 
All right. Thank you. We'll talk to Dr. Uh, Heather Harris, who's the medical director at Hayes Med. Heather, how are things in Hayes, Kansas? Morning. Yeah, our numbers continue to be about the same. Uh, our story doesn't look much different than the last time we reported. We continue to have a census of about 25 COVID, which is a quarter of our census. So it's still a great attention to all of our staff. Our ICU has five in today, which is again, over half of our census. Um, I think a couple of take home points um, is that I, I, these are still greatly majority unvaccinated. 80% of our patients are unvaccinated. So I continue to push that, you know, there is a prevention for, uh, you know, for everyone to get so ill. The other thing I think that everyone needs to understand, it's a younger population. We currently have five people under the age of 50 uh, in the hospital that are quite sick. A couple of them in the ICU actually. So this is not necessarily a, an illness of older folks anymore or patients. It's, it's an illness of, you know, everyone uh, potentially, particularly, you know, unvaccinated. So yeah, we continue to have sick, uh, some sick employees as well, uh, and continue to do the best we can. We, our ICU has been closed for days, you know, struggling with accepting transfers from the critical access hospitals, which, you know, on, as you'll notice, there's no one more West from us. So, uh, you know, trying to serve all those critical access hospitals the best that we can. So yeah, still the same kind of picture and struggle and continue to push people to get vaccinated and stay home when they're sick. Yeah, those are the realities we're going to face, aren't they? And finally, Dr. James Alexander, Chief Medical Officer for Centura St. Catherine. How are things? Don't forget to unmute. Thanks for asking. Uh, I hate to jinx ourselves. I, I think things are actually uh, turning a corner. Uh, we're down to 18 patients in-house with COVID. Uh, we only have three people on ventilators, which is uh, hard to say that we only have three, but out of the eight, but our ICUs continue to be full. Uh, we've had seven deaths in the last uh, 30 days, and a lot of those have been uh, a younger popula population of uh, people. We've had two people on ventilators in the last 30 days, in their 20s, uh, with similar scenarios about vaccination. Um, our number of ED holes is down. Uh, we're rarely having to have anyone stay more than uh, 24 hours. Um, I believe Centura is going to go from orange to yellow toward the end of this week. So that's uh, uh, also a bright spot. Our ED volumes are actually up. Um, uh, but right now we're trying to focus on down the road for the next uh, blip, uh, focusing on uh, getting our workforce uh, healthier, getting our uh, patients uh, a better navigation through the ED to uh, eliminate those readmissions uh, that were so often uh, watched over by um, federal guidelines. Uh, we actually may be mimicking some of Southern Colorado uh, with what's going on, but as a, as a system, again, we're trying to focus on the next uh, bump uh, with a stewardship uh, position alignment uh, to uh, those limited resources. Yeah, that's a tough one now. So I'm going to turn to Hawkeye. Yeah. Hi. Hey, buddy, how are you? I'm good. So um, just to say, we've heard some good news from some yeah. of the sources, but our news may not be quite as good. It's yeah. still pretty pretty high. Yeah, I, I think we're kind of stable uh, as far as that news front, meaning uh, it, it's not so good. You know, we were hoping it's going down. I think we really need to see the trend over a week. But we still do have 116 active infections in the hospital with 24 in the ICU, 18 on the ventilator, 103 in that recovery period, so 219 total patients. Uh, but unfortunately, Steve, we've also had 45 deaths up through today uh, here in the hospital due to COVID as well. Yeah, and a couple of other just quick hitting facts we know. A, our average age is about three to five years less than it has been mm -hmm. before. The length of stay is down by a couple of days. I think that's an Omicron thing. We have a few, the lower percentage of patients going into the ICU now than we did with Delta and, and earlier waves, but the death numbers are really high. And I think this is the problem. When you have twice as many patients as you've ever had with COVID or whatever the how or much more the number mm -hmm. is, now than you did before, your mm -hmm. deaths are going to be high because you're still going to have a lot of people high who are dying. And the people. idea that it's just, oh, my cold is just wrong. So, Jess, let's see what kind of questions are out there. I bet there are a few. There let's are. Let's talk with reporters. Yeah, let's see if there's some reporters. I think we have somebody from the KC Star joining us. 
Hi, yeah, this is uh, Katie Bernard at the Kansas City Star. This morning, um, the state Senate in Kansas is holding a hearing to, for a bill that would make it easier for doctors to prescribe hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin. What impact does it have on you all's work and the trajectory of the pandemic when public officials are taking action to kind of legitimize this sort of misinformation? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm going to I'm going to take a swing at that. I'll ask him. I'll talk to Dr. Antonio Sano. He 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 and I spoke about this bill last evening, and and we'll see what some of our other CMOs think. Here here's the problem. A today we can Hawkeye we can write for medicines that are off label. Now insurance companies may not pay for that, but you can write for off label medications when there's evidence, medical evidence that supports its use. Yes. And the key here is you got to have medical evidence that truly mm-hmm. supports its use. Mm-hmm. So it's not like you can't do it today. You can write for ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine. Uh, there are a few people out there who think there's support for its use med- with uh, evidence-based literature. The problem is that many of the articles that originally supported that had to be retracted because they were falsified or mm-hmm. had false information. Mm-hmm. So the reality is that there aren't as many articles. Yep. There, there are a lot more articles that said it doesn't work. But the problem I have is the legislature has actually have two bills, or Senate Bill 381, which says if a pharmacist receives a prescription for hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin or other off-label use of COVID-19 to either A, prevent, or B, treat COVID-19, they must fill it. Now, today, pharmacists can say, I'm not going to fill a medicine because Mm -hmm. I think it's detrimental to your health. For example, if somebody makes an error in a prescription, it's five times what it should be, the pharmacist can refuse to fill it. This, for this particular bill, 381, it says, Actually, you can't prevent, you can't stop filling it. And then the second bill is another bill, Senate Bill 308, which requires a physician to, pres- to go ahead and give a patient a prescription if they ask for it for tr- COVID-19 therapy. So that means yeah. I have to prescribe mm-hmm. hydroxychloroquine or, 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 um, or uh, ivermectin if someone asks for it. So what the legislature is essentially doing is saying, Okay, Doc, you may think you know your doctor-patient right. relationship, you may know, know your patient, but we know better, mm-hmm. and we're going to make the judgment, not yeah. you, about whether or not you must give a medication. That mm-hmm. makes me feel really bad. Yeah, I, I'm not aware that any of the, those, uh, the people wanting to do this are uh, board-certified infectious disease specialists, pharmacologists, virologists, immunologists, public health uh, officials to have the knowledge about doing that. And I think, as you said, evidence-based medicine rather than opinion-based medicine. We saw uh, Florida shutting down all of their antibody clinics uh, recently this past week when the FDA said, these two antibody cocktails, Regeneron and Eli Lilly, don't work anymore for Omicron. They didn't believe that. In their opinion, they should still be able to give that medicine, even though there is a risk of adverse events. so they just said, well, we're going to take our ball and go home. We're going to shut down all the clinics. So I think your point in what you have been teaching and preaching uh, ever since I started training here uh, is evidence-based medicine. And currently, the evidence-based medicine around uh, things like ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, when you take out all of those biases and those articles uh, that have been retracted or their authors have been reprimanded, it shows no benefit to receiving those either for prophylaxis or treatment against COVID-19. So I think we really need to continue to practice evidence-based medicine, understand all of the literature, critique that literature, and go on from there, evidence-based medicine rather than opinion-based medicine. Dr. Antonio's thoughts? Yeah, well, I just think that there is going to be a lot of confusion. It's confusing why try to um, uh, put things in, in law that might interfere with the relationship between the patient and their doctor. Uh, as we all know, and as we've all learned, that there is a a specific type of relationship that is created typically between a physician and their patient. Um, and it has to be built on trust and mutual understanding. Uh, and that's what's taught in medical school. Um, I just think it's very confusing. We don't, I don't understand necessarily why now try to um, create something that's going to disrupt this particular relationship is going to uh, really step into uh, the medical practice. And uh, I agree, we obviously every physician needs to strive to follow the evidence um, and try to track it either from peers or from reliable sources. And that's what drives decision making along with informed consent. Um, so the concern is the amount of bafflement and confusion that's going to exist in the community when there are um, things that historically have never existed in this type of realm. So. Um, 
yeah, I'm not sure about the, the, the value of this. Yeah, I think it's a tough one. Dr. Freeman, what are your thoughts? Don't forget to unmute. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Uh, um, Dr. Freelove, I'm, I'm sorry. I would, no, no, no. <laughs> you know, I'm that's terrible okay. with names some days. Apologize for that. Well, yeah, Freelove's a tough one. So, um, <laughs> uh, it's fun growing up, but go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be honest, I'm, I'm, um, I'm baffled at, at the in, intrusion into um, practicing medicine. Uh, and if we're going to require something and say that if, if your doctor says you have to do it, you have to go do it, uh, or the, the pharmacist has to do it, that, uh, or I, I'm sorry, if a patient asks for it, I mean, we're, that's a pretty slippery slope to um, a pretty dangerous place. Um, and if we're gonna require something, why not require something that we know works, which is vaccines? So. I'll be honest, I'm, I'm a little bit baffled by um, the thought process at uh, trying to, to legislate um, health care to that level. Yeah, it's pretty kind of micromanaging. Dr. Dishman, thoughts? You know, I've reflected on this quite a bit, and I, I agree with what Dr. Antonio said. The relationship, the patient-physician relationship is sacred. And that's where we ought to be receiving our information in a direct relationship with our primary care physician. I am concerned deeply um, my ability to practice in the state of, the can state of Kansas um, comes via the Board of Healing Arts. And um, if, uh, if, if my board wants to, wants to, um, wants to decide how that, uh, that we're going to practice medicine, um, then there is a process for doing that in the state of Kansas. The, um, I find it very concerning when we go outside of the regular process for compliance and um, assurance of privileging and credentialing. Uh, that process has been in place for a long time. It has worked well. And to try to um, circumvent that process uh, through uh, mandation by state law is very concerning to me and I believe should be concerning to all physicians in the state of Kansas. Yes, I think that I think that makes sense. And and uh, let's see, Jess, if there are other questions out there. So on that, oh, go ahead. Please go ahead. There's somebody else wanted to. Dr. Alexander, please. So um, I'm trying not to be political, and I know I'm going to step on the toes, but uh, if the Senators and representatives like to focus on something that really is impacting all of our health care in all of our cities. It's the exorbitant price of staffing agencies. And God help us to regulate something else in medicine, but until they can impact that, that causes the uh, continuous flow of uh, qualified nursing from one uh, facility to the next uh, based on a dollar. Uh, that I think that's something they should look at. Yeah, I totally agree. And just to, just to point out the other obvious flaw in this whole discussion, the Senate bill is passing, and there's one point in time. What happens in three months from now if there's a weight of evidence really against ivermectin, but now you still have to write for it? Or what happens if there's another drug with it, but you still have to write for it? This is this is this is a significant disruption to how people really practice medicine. Look, I, I'm not gonna go tell you how to practice agriculture. I'm not gonna tell you how to do aerospace engineering, but I've got folks trying to tell me how I have to write prescription medications and that I have to fill it, even if I know it, it's against what it, it should happen. And unfortunately, people listen to all sorts of made up news and, and now we're having to reward made up news with writing a prescription that could easily be disruptive or harmful to somebody and a pharmacist must fill it. This is this is an this is a unwelcome, unsafe intrusion into the practice of medicine. At some level, we have to get back to common sense and reality. And again, if you and a patient agree that you want to try ivermectin right now, you can do it. You don't need the state legislature to do it. The difference is I'm not required to write the script, and the pharmacist is not required to fill the script. 
That's the problem here, folks. And just to say, you're removed from all civil liability. So if you want to practice outside the boundaries of medicine, you never have to worry about getting sued. I'm just saying as a patient advocate, that sounds like I, I'm not in love with malpractice attorneys, but there is a certain check and balance, and it feels like we've completely disrupted the check and balance with this. Not that I feel strongly. Maybe I do. Other questions on the line? Okay, so let's keep this conversation going. Um, uh, Kansas Reflector wants to know, so what would uh, the folks on the panel recommend the Kansas legislature or Governor Kelly do at this stage to respond to this surge? Is it legislation, mandates, um, just what type of recommendations? Where do you go from here? All right, let's turn to our panel and see what, what folks might be thinking. What other things can we do to help improve the outcome of this pandemic? Kim McGow, you, you, HCA, lots of hospitals throughout Kansas. What do you think? I think that the, the thing that you've been preaching for a while, Dr. Stocks, um, which is good sound uh, recommendation, which is to practice good infection control measures. You know, wear masks, particularly when crowded inside events, um, in, if you're in that sort of setting, uh, get vaccinated, get the booster, Stay home if you're sick. Um, the things that we know are effective, I think we need to continue to do that. And where the um, legislators can have some influence in that, that would be welcome. Yeah, that does make sense. Let, let's turn to Dr. Hayes. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I mean, I would love more support from the state government as well as far as providing testing supplies, um, increasing our availability of you know, those in the community getting a PCR test, also increasing the availability of medications that we know that have been proven to reduce the risk of hospitalization, those monoclonal antibody like citrovimab, um, increasing the oral antiviral medications like Paxlovid, um, helping increase the availability of the things that we know that can benefit our patients and prevent hospitalizations and death. That's where I would like to see our uh, government focus their uh, energy towards. Yeah, that would be so helpful. And Dr. Scripture, from your standpoint, you've been, you're a public health officer for Douglas County. Thoughts? Uh, Stites, I'm still fired up about the legislature. <laughs> so I, I've been Go thinking ahead. about that for a while. Uh, Go right ahead. No, I'm just, um, I, I, I just, oh, so uh, two points on that. Pharmacists are kind of our last line, um, a safety net for patients. If I prescribe something that has a critical drug interaction with a, a medication that maybe I didn't have on my medication list in clinic or had no idea the patient was on, the pharmacist is, the, is that last line of protection for the patient. So if there's a critical drug interaction and the pharmacist says no, um that's that should be their right and and it should be left to take care of our patients keep our patients safe and the other is why dr hayes i would like a prescription for insulin i'm not diabetic i haven't had a test to see if i'm diabetic but i think i should be on insulin so you need to give me insulin i mean that that does that not sound ridiculous or narcotics or anxiety uh, addicting medications mm -hmm. etc yes. Dr. Hayes, I also have terrible anxiety, and I need a lot of um, uh, Xanax. Yeah. Uh, you should give it to me. Uh, it's uh, that's just ridiculous. Um, as far as what what they can what the what they can do to help, things we've said, and I say it over and over: masks in in indoor public and outdoor crowded public spaces. Um, I know vaccines are. Um, uh, you know, hot topic and, and the federal um, rules recently, um, but they, they need to be required in certain settings. Healthcare is one, schools is another. Um, testing, we need testing. Agency costs, that is price gouging. Um, we just wanna take care of people. We wanna keep people safe. We wanna keep people alive. And really, we want to keep people out of our hospitals that don't need to be here. So, um, yeah, all the things we've been saying since day one, Dr. Stites. You bet. One thing I would just to say is it would be great to see an investment in public health. 
you know, one of the things I'm struck by is how slowly we even knew about Omicron and how hard it's been to get realistic estimates to help base our own hospital mm -hmm. policy about when we can open and when we can't close on the operating rooms and things like that. And it would be wonderful to get genomic analysis on a rapid basis. It would be wonderful to have better, stronger public health measures so we could follow this disease and predict how we can treat everybody better. Remember, it's not just about COVID. It's about our ability to treat everyone. So I think the number one thing that we can do, and you're hearing it from all of us, um, stick to the facts. Let's make the investments back on in our public health infrastructure to make sure we can take care of people from all disease types. Jess. Uh, Dr. Seitz, we're running out of time, so I'm going to um, hold some of these great viewer questions for tomorrow, and I'll let you go ahead and get to your final thoughts. Okay. Well, I want to first just say thanks to all of our terrific chief medical officers here today. You heard from everybody, and I think we pre pretty clearly have what our vote is on um, on some of these key, uh, key issues in front of us. And uh, because there's there's a lot of us, we won't turn to every single person for a final thought. I will ask Hawkeye. You haven't had a good chance to say much today. Any, yeah. any final thoughts that you have, sir? No, I mean, I think I'll all of our guests said it so eloquently. I would second all of those. Please, uh, you know, tell your friends uh, and your neighbors about this show. There are such good opinions uh, based on knowledge and fact and evidence, and I, I would continue to support all of our guests and what they've said here today. Dr. Antonio, you had a, qu uh, a quick thought too, I think. Uh, yeah, I was just going to add that one of the things that, you know, to, you, you mentioned investment in public health. I would also want to advocate for investment in the healthcare workforce. Over the last two years, there's been a lot of burnout. There's been a lot of um, impact on the healthcare workforce, and that's not just physicians. It's nurses, uh, uh, you know, echo techs, CT scan operators, et cetera, et cetera. And um, it would be wonderful to see some investments in um, the development of the workforce, because that will help both rural and urban areas, uh, schools, programs, uh, loan forgiveness programs, things that would uh, increase the workforce and improve the resiliency of the healthcare system as a whole. It's a critical infrastructure um, that is worthy of the investment. Yeah, that, that think makes sense. And does anybody else have any final thoughts that they want to offer us today? I don't see any hands going up, so I'm just, go ahead. Dr. Stey, hey, this is Mark Steele at Please, the University Mark. Health. Just, I, I would absolutely second what Dr. Antonio just talked about, uh, investing in workforce development. That's a gigantic need, particularly given the level of burnout. And, and I just wanted to uh, toss out uh, a statistic uh, that I recently saw that for those who are fully vaccinated and have been boosted, that there's, they are a hundred times less likely to die from COVID compared to someone who is unvaccinated. And that's an extraordinarily powerful statistic. And uh, so I, for those out there still sitting on the fence about getting, uh, getting vaccinated, or if you're fully vaccinated and not boosted, uh, you really ought to be uh, boosted so that you fully protect yourself from, from the, this virus. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. And I just wanted to, uh, again, say thanks to all our chief medical officers. Thanks for everybody listening today. Hey, one final thought, too. When we look at our analysis, 12 or 11.4% 11 of our patients are fully vaccinated, right? 11 point, that means vaccinated and if you need it, boosted. But the other 88% are, 88% are, uh, 88 plus percent are either A, not vaccinated, which is the overwhelming majority, or those who have not had a recent vaccination. And, and I think... What it points to is that we know the way out of the pandemic, and the way out of the pandemic is to follow the science, and, and the science clearly shows us the direction to go. And the more we follow that, the more we can take care of everybody, get our operating rooms back open, treat heart attacks, not letting patients die in emergency rooms, and most of all, as we've experienced, not having extraordinarily high deaths from what is truly a preventable disease. At least there's preventable deaths. And so at the end of the day, we're here to help you. Let us do our job. Thank you all being for being here. We're back tomorrow, Jess. I'm going to pitch it back to you. We are. Okay, so last week we took you inside our Decedent Affairs Department, what most may know of as the morgue. A lot of you had some questions, and so we're going to be joined by a couple of members of that department to help kind of demystify what goes on down there and certainly during this time of COVID. So we leave you today with this preview. We want to show you that for some patients, that final journey to the morgue begins up on the ICU floor.
I had one day where I had three people die before 9 a.m., before even having my coffee. It was hard, too, because they weren't just, they died on full supported machines, and I ended up removing tubes while they were dead. And it's hard because we go into this profession to see people get better, and it's not the way anybody likes to start a day. This unit used to be a COVID primary unit back in the surge of 2020, and we were able to actually keep it free of COVID for a while. And then we had to start bringing patients back over here um, during this last surge this winter, 2021 into 2022. And so um, now this is our second ICU being used for COVID. Omicron spreads fast. It spreads very fast and every single day we have about five to seven RTs out sick from it. Even the other day when I worked, somebody had to leave in the middle of the shift for getting a fever. Just because it's a cold for you, you know, I'm, I'm happy for you. That's, that's awesome. But some people are not that fortunate. So we turn um, our patient's heads every two hours because it's really hard on your body to sleep on your face. I'm 37. To see people younger than me get so sick and not have any underlying health issues necessarily, you know, it's depressing. You're shopping at Target, life actually seems pretty normal. You see a lot of people walking around without their mask on, but then you come here and that's when reality kind of sinks in.